Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Miki Chaimovich. I'm VP Business Development with RSIP Vision, a global leader in computer vision and deep learning. Uh, for this webinar, I will be hosting Alan Jorosalmi, our VP Pharma. Hello, Alan. Hi, Miki. How are you? Good. Um, and we will be discussing uh, implementing AI in your ph pharma company, do's and don'ts. Uh, let's start. Oops, one second. Sorry for that. Just give me a second. Okay, what's on the agenda? Uh, we'll start with a brief uh, introduction of RSIP Vision. Uh, then we will discuss the differences between computer vision and AI in the medical industry. Uh, some people think it's the same thing and it's not uh, like that. Uh, then we will show you a few examples of how you use AI in pathology as well as in radiology. And uh, lastly, of course, the, the main topic, we will discuss how it is uh, best to introduce AI for image analysis in your company. As usual, we will end with the Q&A uh, session. So this is a good opportunity to ask you all to share your uh, questions with us. Uh, you don't need to wait for the end of the uh, webinar, just send them as you think about them and we will uh, make every effort to answer uh, all of them at the end of the session. If we won't uh, be able to answer all the questions, we'll uh, get back to you uh, directly uh, after the webinar. Okay, so a few words about the uh, RSIP vision. Um, we are providing AI and deep learning solutions for uh, image analysis. That's the only thing we do. Uh, we don't deal with NLP or anything uh, of sort. Uh, the solution is customized based on your project needs and your data set. Uh, this industry is very far from standardization and the chances that you'll find a solution that is tailored to your needs uh, which is off the shelf, uh, are, are very slim. So we take a different approach. We start with you, with your project needs. Uh, you want to do things faster. You want to do things uh, in a more accurate manner. You want to do things uh, more cost effectively and so on and so forth. Then we have a look at your data set, uh, which of course differs between uh, our customers. And then we customize a, a solution that is based on your data set and is aimed on your project needs. This is what we do. We've been doing that for over 25 years in the field with multiple repeat clients in the USA. Uh, we have extensive experience in all AI and deep learning techniques in numerous pharma and medical uh, applications. We do things in addition to pharma and medical applications, but this is most of what we do. Uh, and we have an experienced team of over 45 engineers located in Tel Aviv, Silicon Valley, and Boston. Uh, in addition to those engineers, we have a medical team in staff to guide solution development, including radiology, pathology, and more. So the bottom line is in case you plan to develop an AI solution, a RSIP vision is the safest, most stable way to do it. We have experience in a broad range of uh, AI applications. You can see some of them here. Uh, you can see we've dealt with all the major modalities, CT, MRI, X-ray, uh, ultrasound, uh, OCT, uh, many uh, examples of uh, pathology, uh, all kinds of uh, microscopy slides and so on and so forth. And we've touched pretty much every organ in the body and every type of tissue uh, out there. Let me tell you a little bit about the process. As I said, this is not a standardized uh, industry. So, you know, when you ask me, okay, I want an AI solution to implement uh, in my pharma company, in my uh, drug development uh, processes, uh, you know, how long will it take? How, uh, what will be the cost and so on and so forth. I can't just tell you a straightforward answer, okay? The answer is it depends. Uh, but I, I don't want to tell you just it depends. So we start with the proof of concept. The goal of the proof of concept is A, to show you what the fuss is all about, okay? I, AI is a buzzword, everybody's talking about it, but do we really know, you know, what, is, what it's about? 
no, it's not always the case. So I want to show you something before I ask for your uh, commitment. The other one is that making the proof of concept enables us to uh, get a better understanding of your data set and of your project needs, which enables us to uh, uh, start the, the, the design and the structure of the project. And of course, to uh, tell you how long it will take and what will be uh, the price. So we start when we sign a mutual NDA, CDA, uh, you are uh, our customers, we are uh, here to do things for you, but your secrets and, uh, and your uh, data uh, stays with you. Okay, so we sign an NDA so that everybody will be uh, very comfortable. Then we define what parameters and deliverables are needed from the POC. These would not be the parameters and deliverables of the uh, complete solution, but it will be enough in order to make you understand what we're talking about. And then the customer provides annotated samples. As I always say, uh, we don't need many samples and they even they don't have to be annotated. Okay, I'm saying that because uh, many times I speak to people and tell me, listen, I'm, I'm just in the beginning, I don't have many samples, or I don't know if I'll be able to handle the annotations. So we have a lot of solutions for that. Uh, uh, so don't make this a reason not to call us. Call us and we'll tell you exactly what we can do with what you have now and what we can do later in the future. Um, then we really developed the POC solution, okay, based on the samples that were provided. Uh, this is, uh, it can take a few weeks, but it's not that we disappear. On the contrary, this is an uh, iterative process. We have weekly discussions and updates regarding the solution development. It's very important that we speak to one another, that we get your feedbacks and so on and so forth. Once the POC is ready, then we present it to you. We present it to uh, your uh, executives, the people who make the decisions in your organizations, whoever they are. And once we get the green light, then we define the fully developed solution. Uh, RSIP, of course, develops that solution. And again, this is an iterative process with weekly discussions and updates uh, regarding the solution de development. It can take two months, okay, in some cases. It can take four months. It can take six months. It all depends on the project. Uh, but basically, the bottom line here is that it, within a few months, you can have an up and running AI solution that is customized to your needs and is integrated into your uh, uh, processes. Uh, so that was a brief introduction. And with that, I'll hand it over to Alan uh, to tell us a little bit about the differences between computer vision and AI in the medical industry. Uh, Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you for that introduction to the company. Yeah, so now we're gonna start getting into the main focus of today's webinar, which is how to introduce AI into your uh, image analysis needs. So uh, before we get into the, uh, Mickey, there you go. Before we get into the actuals of the AI itself, it's important to talk a little bit about what is image analysis for pharma. So classical computer vision or classical image analysis has been used and widely adopted in pharma for quite some time now. You know, it's been used in areas such as toxicology, drug development, um, digital pathology, of course, and a number of LDTs have been devised as well as uses in medical devices and surgical procedures. The reason for all of this um, adoption really has to do with the benefits that it offers to pharma, such as speeding up drug development and also providing additional insights into the data that we generate from image analysis. Now, everything, of course, revolves around AI and medical imaging. Uh, and we really can talk about that in the sense that uh, AI really is improving the, there you go. Uh, so AI is really able to transform the medical industry by creating opportunities that have not been thought of possible before. The main reasons for that is the increasing availability of medical data and also recent advances in machine learning technology, as well as the neural networks that are today available. So we can think of it in the sense that machine learning is a model that learns patterns in the data and then can predict similar patterns in new data that it gets exposed to. 
Now, the main differences when we talk about machine learning versus the classical approach really have to do with the fact that machine learning algorithms don't depend on rules that are predefined by the human experts. So I'm going to use a very simple example to illustrate the differences between machine learning algorithms and the classical image analysis approach. So if we look at the slide in front of us, we're just looking at a simple blood smear with a number of different cells that I would like to classify by my solution. So if I'm using a classical approach and I want to be able to segment and classify properly the lymphocytes, the xenophils, platelets, red blood cells, and et cetera, what I need to do is have very precise rules, rules or definitions of each one of those objects. For example, a lymphocyte has a specific diameter and size. Um, the nuclei has a specific shape to it. Uh, platelets are much smaller than that and so forth. So I have to list all of those. And what we do later with computer vision is take all of that information and create a set of classifiers that can then segment and classify the data into the right um, objects. Now, when we get into machine learning, the process becomes much more um, simplified in the sense that we don't need to have those hard and set rules. What we do is we annotate all of the objects of interest and you can see here in the image by the different colors, all of the classified objects are annotated. And what we do is we feed all of that information into our machine learning algorithms and then the computer takes over. And from there, the computer is able to devise a segmentation and classification that typically tends to have a much better accuracy when compared to the classical approach. And that has many uses. Um, here's a very good classical example of a comparison between an algorithm that was run both by classical approach and by deep learning. So what we're trying to do here is successfully classify um, nuclear stain Ki67 on 60,000 nuclei. So if we look at the very right, those are the objects that we're trying to classify out of the tissue. So tumor positive versus anything that's just an artifact in the brown color as well. And then for the negative nuclei, I want to be able to classify what's a stroma, what's a lymphocyte, and what's uh, just a negative tumor. So if I'm using a classical approach, it could take quite some time and a lot of development effort to do that. And everything is done via classifiers, adaptive thresholding, some watershed techniques, and a number of other um, computer vision um, uh, methodology that we can use. However, when we go to deep learning, in just under a month, I can replicate the exact same work and get much more accurate results. So it becomes a much faster and accurate way of doing things. The same thing holds true if I want to use a deep learning solution to classify and segment nuclei in h and &E stain. So what you're looking at here is eight different uh, H&E images of eight different tumor types. And all of these was uh, segmented and the nuclei classified using a single deep learning um, network. Of course, there may be some um, additional training that happens for each tumor type to get our specificity in, in, and accuracy even better. But the idea is it's all done into a single deep learning network. If I were to compare this with the classical uh, image analysis approach, I really would have to devise very different strategies for the different um, types of HNEs that you see here due to the differences in intensity of color and, and et cetera. And the same thing will hold true if I want to use a deep learning solution on um, IF images where I want to segment all of the DAPI stain nuclei. And the main challenge here is that those nuclei are going to have a number of different shapes, right? They're going to be very long. They can be small, uh, round, touching each other. And there's a lot of different intricacies that can happen when we try to segment the nuclei. However, with the deep learning approach, because we're training them, on what each one of those nuclei look like, we're able to have a very accurate segmentation. And again, everything happens with one single solution based on one deep learning network. Now, if I shift gears a little bit and apply the same technique to CT-based images, basically the same thing holds true. So if we look um, at a project where we're classifying um, and segmenting airway, using both methods, either deep learning approach or the classical approach. So using the classical method, you can see uh, the development time at the bottom. It, it took just about 12 months to get the work done, which is very time consuming. A lot of development goes into it. And there are limitations as to how much of the airway we're able to segment. When we go into a deep learning approach, the time is about a quarter of the time and the accuracy is much higher. 
So if we take the end result, where's the deep learning uh, segmented array on the right versus the classical method on the left, you can really see the differences, how we're able to get much finer airways where it branches out on one method versus the other. And then if I apply that into other CT-based images, now we're able to start to get very accurate detection of tumors in different organs. Here we're looking at lung segmentation and liver segmentation, but again, both using a deep learning network to classify the to classify and segment our tumors. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how do you go about introducing AI for your image analysis needs. So before we get into it, it's really important to see that the role of AI in image analysis really is um, to bring image analysis applications to a whole new level of technology and capability. And then also the role of AI is to provide support in all areas of drug discovery and clinical development. And what are the impacts that we believe are gonna happen with pharma once AI gets introduced? Well, first of all, we're going to see an increased quality and accuracy of analysis data. There's gonna be uh, the ability to create predictive biomarkers. Uh, we're gonna be able to also have insights into cellular morphology once we relate that to genetic changes in tissue. Uh, it has the potential to accelerate drug development time and also has the potential to provide some cost savings, uh, not only because of the time, but also by automating some of the tasks that happen. So if you think about, okay, now I have AI introduced, what is my workflow going to look like? Well, the first thing you need to do is upload your images into a specific location. Um, you're then going to take the solution that we would have built for you, and that solution is gonna perform all of the segmentation, classification, it's gonna do all of the work for you. You then can go into as the expert of the data and you have a chance to review, make sure that there is no issues that happen, do a quick QC on the images. And from there you have your data getting generated. And then because we are getting such good uh, segmentation and we're classifying each one of those objects and exporting a number of different features for them, you have that opportunity to generate new insights for that. So looking at the entire workflow of AI and image analysis, why are we saying it allows for better data generation? Well, for once, you're going to have an increased analytic precision and accuracy. Then you're gonna bypass all of the inter and inter variability, variability that may occur. Uh, we're able to eliminate a lot of the repetitive chores that you do. Uh, this all can lead to faster generation of data. It's going to hopefully increase your efficiency. And then again, because we're able to extract all these different features, we're able to potentially generate additional insights that were not available before. Now, when we think of introducing AI in-house, of course, there's always some challenges. And the biggest challenge to introducing AI in-house lies with the talent gap that exists. There's a very scarce number of professionals that have both the deep technical understanding and the drug discovery and AI development and implementation skills. So for that reason, it is much faster and much more effective to establish a partnership with an AI company as opposed to try to get uh, an AI team yourself. Okay, so let's say you made up your mind, you're ready to go ahead and start with the AI project. So what should you do? So again, the first thing is to find a reliable partner to engage with and what you wanna look for in that partner really is a partner that has an experience and track record of developing AI-based solutions, uh, a partner that understands the complexity of these advanced models and understands how to properly configure and use them. You also, uh, once you have a partner that can help you properly configure all of that data that goes into the solution. Remember, we're doing a lot of supervised learning. We're putting a lot of annotations. You wanna make sure that the information going in to all of these models is correct. And then the last one is you wanna be able to provide a partner that will provide you with transparency during development. There's the whole stigma of a black box around AI. So really you need a partner that's gonna work with you to remove all of those barriers and really make the process very clear and transparent to you so you have a full understanding of what's happening with your data and what's happening with the solution creation. So the first thing you wanna do after that is really start with the pilot project. You wanna be able to run a controlled experiment where you can uh, maximize the chances of getting a successful pilot. And this is where you really wanna leverage your partner's experience 
to make sure that you're identifying a good data set. A lot of times our customers will come to me with three or four projects that they have in mind to start on their pilot and we'll have a quick discussion and quickly identify out of those four, which one is very suited for AI versus another one that may not be the best suited project for AI. So really leverage your partner's experience for this. And then the final thing is um, get internal buy-in from your key stakeholders. And what you wanna do here is, first of all, you wanna highlight the advantages in automating this process. You wanna stress the value of obtaining additional insights into the data. And don't forget to emphasize all of the downstream efficiency that you can gain and the time that you can save by doing this. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Thank you for this talk. Um, you're welcome. It was very interesting. Uh, just to add a little bit to what uh, Alan said, uh, you know, uh, more about what we can do for you. So the first thing we want to do for you is to pretty much, you know, give you this webinar, okay, and the PPT behind it. Uh, namely, uh, we, are, we, we would be happy to provide you with the best of tools to convince the right people that AI is the right thing uh, to do and, and to show them what would be the right thing, uh, what would, uh, how it would be best to implement it. Okay, so please, uh, before everything else, just use us. Contact us. We've given you here a few generic tips, but uh, we are happy to, uh, as Alan this, uh, said, we're happy to do it uh, for you on a personal level to dis discuss your needs. Uh, and please do contact us, and, and we can start that discussion. But still, a few more uh, tips uh, for the uh, for the way. Uh, I think you know we've discussed it, but uh, I can just stress again that uh, RSAP can support you with deep knowledge in AI with focus on medical field. There are not so many uh, out there who can say that about themselves. And if this is what you're looking for, then you know it would be worthwhile uh, giving us a call. Um, our team has significant experience in building AI-based solutions. We've shown you uh, some of them uh, uh, now, and we have many others that might be more suitable for your exact needs. So again, contact us and we'll be happy to help and you know tailor the PPT for you. Um, we have done applications on all areas of medical segmentation, radiology, digital pathology, medical devices, surgical procedures, pretty much everything that this industry has uh, to offer. We, we've been there, we've done that. And again, this is all uh, uh, available uh, for you guys. Uh, transparency on all phases of engagement, as Alan uh, mentioned, uh, we believe that it's very important. As Alan said, you know, AI is still a buzzword and a bit of a black box. And, you know, we understand the importance of being transparent about it. Uh, it's very clear to us and it was always the case when uh, uh, in past uh, projects. Uh, and, you know, if we're mentioning past projects, then we would be happy to direct you to our clients uh, to hear more about uh, their experience and what we've done uh, for them. Uh, so that was the why. Now let's uh, summarize uh, not only the webinar, but, but the, the entire uh, thing, we, what we can uh, do for you. As Alan said, uh, it starts with the, with the project design. Uh, many times, once you know you get the understanding that you can do good things with AI, it still doesn't mean that you know exactly how and when and where to go about it. Uh, so, and we we have a lot of experience in that. Uh, so please do uh, contact us, and we will help you identify the processes that would benefit from AI implementation. As Alan said, sometimes you know there's more than one. Sometimes there is more than two and more than three. And we're we're very we have a lot of experience in you know identifying the right one for you. Uh, and then, as I said beforehand, we will perform a proof of concept to present in-house. We understand the importance of that, uh, and we're happy to do that. Uh, the second thing is project structure. Okay, uh, we structure project to ensure early and cost-effective impact. Again, when somebody gives you the budget, you know they want to see results. They want to see them as quickly as possible. We totally get it. We've been in this. Uh, area for a long time and we will structure the project such that you know uh, as quickly as possible you will have something to show okay once we do that everybody's happy everybody see uh, sees the, the benefits and then it's much easier to move to stage two and stage three and so on and so forth and we've been working with customers for years and it all began with step one and now we can be in step 15. 
Um, still, you know, we always have a plan, but sometimes, uh, you know, there are changes. And once you started somewhere, you want to continue somewhere else. Your needs have changed, and we are happy to modify the project according to, to changing needs. Okay, it's very important. This is a flexible process, and we're always there for you. And if your plans change, then we uh, will uh, change uh, our development plans accordingly. And lastly, of course, we've told you that many times the project execution, we have a lot of experience and we do everything for you from uh, annotation to any, anything else that you that you need. We're not only AI expert, we, we can provide additional services that are required in the uh, medical uh, area. So with that, yeah, I think we've reached our uh, Q&A uh, session. Um, I again, I do encourage you to share your uh, questions and uh, send them over. I see that some of you have already sent them. Uh, let me just look at them. One second. And let's see what we're being asked. Okay. Um, question number one. Uh, what is the typical size of a training set required to develop a robust clinical trial assay uh, solution? Can you use uh, uh, archival samples uh, to measure and accurately detect IHC-based biomarkers on new prospective samples from first in human uh, clinical trials? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll take some of that. Uh, basically, the answer, again, I'm sorry to tell you, is that it depends. Okay, uh, I, it will be easier for me to, to give you a more direct answer once I see even just one sample. The reason for that is that uh, the, the size of the samples uh, varies. Uh, so for instance, let's say you're looking for some type of uh, uh, nuclear segmentation. In one slide, okay, there could be, let's say, I don't know, 3,000 nuclei, okay? So that's that's a significant number, even if it's just one slide, okay? Uh, but, but so, you know, the number of samples might not be uh, uh, very high if there are uh, um, enough uh, examples to what we're looking for within each and every uh, slide, but uh, it really changes. So the best thing would be just to uh, drop us an email, we can jump on a call and we'll better understand, you know, your exact project and the samples that you have, and we'll be happy to uh, to give you a more uh, a, a, a accurate answer. Um, so the, the second part was, can you use uh, samples to measure and accurately detect IHC? Um, Alan, do you want to take that? I can, yeah. And maybe I can elaborate a little bit on the first part too. So if you're trying to create yeah. a, a pretty robust solution that will go into the clinic, then you know, you, you're talking about a, a good size um, data set, right? Because we remember there's always two components to everything that we do when we talk about image analysis, solutions and developing these algorithms. We always require our training set, our training set, which is the set that we use to build the solutions. But then we need to validate that against uh, a new data set that hasn't encountered that solution yet. So to build a robust, a robust solution, if we're talking about whole slide imaging, we're probably talking initially, we would need on that training um, uh, probably one or 200 images. Um, and then we wanna have at least another 200 for the validation set. And again, the more that we have, the more accurate uh, we're able to come up with that, that solution. And then the second part of the question was dealing with uh, commercially available samples correct and whether or not we can use those. So assuming that you're you're using the same markers, the same everything, we should be able to use those sets as part of the training set because all the objects of interest that we're gonna use for the annotations that will go into those models are gonna be available there. And of course, the more samples that we encounter, the more we're able to extract these um, objects and put them into our neuro, neural networks, the better that solution will get. Excellent. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, let's see if there are a few more questions. Mm -mm -mm. Um, another question, can you give more examples of new insights into the data? Yeah, th this is important. Alan, what, what do you say to that? Yeah, I can take this one. Um, yeah, so if we kind of stay to the, the same kind of concept of digital pathology, right? So in the context of cellular analysis, 
Of course, because what we're doing now, we're extracting different features from each one of the objects that we we segmented and we classified. Uh, and these features can be things such as what's what are the sizes, what are the shapes, uh, where are the locations in, in relative to the tumor, tumor border, um, what's the relationship between one cell or another. So once you start extracting all of these features and then you have a ground truth such as what is a responder, what's a non-responder, you can start looking at all that as a whole and put them into the right models to start extracting um, new insights from data. When we think about a few years ago when all we had was someone looking at the microscope, there's no way that you can um, accurately measure the, the size and shape of a thousand different cells, right? But now because this is all computerized, of course we can do that. And that's the type of data that can help you generate new insights. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I'll, I'll say uh, that in a nutshell, uh, AI has a huge potential in everything that uh, is uh, quantification. Okay, uh, we do the we segment whatever is there on the image, we classify it, but uh, the quantification is really a key, as Alan said, and it, uh, you can really count pretty much everything uh, that is uh, that is on the in the image, uh, and this presents significant advantages from clinical perspective and in other ways. Uh, so even if you know you feel comfortable about uh, the way you segment things or the way you classify things, even without AI. Uh, then quantification is often uh, something that AI can provide, uh, which basically cannot be provided in any other way. Um, another question, uh, how can I measure the accuracy of AI solutions? Uh, Alan, what uh, do you yeah, say? Yeah, I can take that one again. Um, sure, uh, good question. So there's different ways that we can do this, right? Um, of course, the most typical way is always to, to measure the AI solution against the ground truth. Um, you know, one very traditional way will be to take different subsets of the data. You can do some um, manual annotations or some manual quantification there and then compare that with your um, AI overlays. Of course, a lot of it goes back to your pathologist or your, your radiologist, depending on the data set, where they're going to look at both data sets for, for measuring the accuracy. But the the best way is really, like I said, take a subset of the data, spend a little bit of time manually counting what's there, and then you run that against um, the solution that you just uh, ran, and you can get a very accurate count of what's going on and how accurate your solution is. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, another question here. Let me see. Da, da, da. I, I can't use AI because it's a black box. Okay, uh, and I won't know what the parameters in the algorithms are. How can you be transparent here? Alan, yeah, what do we so, say? Uh, so for once, right, we will be able to provide details of the methods and the architecture of the neural networks that were used. Uh, there's also transparency on the parameters that were used. Um, there are some available tools that allow for the visualization of network activations, and one of them is called an attention map. Um, and these will show the important regions of the images and um, how the decisions were taken. So there are some tools that can uh, give you those, those transparencies and, and get away from the black box concept. And again, make sure that you're involved in the process. So whoever is building your AI solution is including you in the process. They're showing you what's getting annotated, what's getting into the models, and all of those things together eliminate a lot of the transparency that's commonly associated with that. Excellent. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, I'll add to that that once the solution is developed, you get the code. Okay. So the, there, there can't be anything that is really hidden from you uh, uh, because you get the code. You just don't just get, you know, the results or the, the, the anything like that. You get the real code and, you know, it's all in your hands. Um, let's see what else are we being asked today. Um, mm -hmm. If I have images and want to use AI on them, what is the full process? Okay, I, I think we've touched upon that. Uh, but you know, if, it's, if there are still questions, and no problem, contact us, and then we'll we'll elaborate. Um, okay, what are the limitations of technology for object detection and segmentation? Uh, what do you say, Alan? So it, it really mainly depends on the noise of your data. 
right? Typically, if it's something that's very challenging for humans to see, um, and it's very challenging for humans to differentiate, there may be a challenge initially to guide the system on what are the ground truths. Um, however, once you have that, and once you have those ground, ground truths established, AI typically can do a better job than humans can because they can see much better separation between the channels, right? There's a lot of things that the computer can see that we can't see. But when the data is not uniform enough, if the data is not uniform enough, then in order to account for that, we may need slightly larger number of samples. Um, or another thing that may happen is if the assay is not fully stable, you may need to stabilize your assay a little bit to eliminate a lot of that noise that can happen. Excellent, excellent. Um, so I think um, that we've reached the end of the of the session. Uh, if there are any other questions, something that you you know you thought you you'll think about in the coming minutes, the coming hours, the coming days, no problem. Uh, feel free to drop us an email or give us a call, and we'll be happy to answer those as well. And uh, stay tuned, as usual, for our next uh, webinars. We Lately, we've been doing them pretty much once every two weeks or so. And we intend to continue with that in the foreseeable future. And we'll be happy to have you uh, in the future. Uh, Mickey, so uh, thank just you very a much, quick. Uh, yes. I think, yes. I think I saw another question pop by, and we um, probably could be interesting to respond. There was a question that I saw about how many images do you need for a pilot study? So. Just a quick okay. note on that one. So no pilot studies, um, you know, they, they can be very small. So even if you have like 10, 20, 30 images, we're able to, to have your first pilot study and we're still able to use AI on them. So don't think that just because you don't have a large enough data set, you're not able to start with something. So having a few images already will allow us to build the very initial stages of how we would build the AI solution. So you can already start to see the results there. Yeah, a good, uh, good emphasize. Uh, thank you for this, Alan. Um, so really, speak to us. We're here. We're happy to help you. Not only you know with these uh, webinars, but also by just uh, communicating directly and uh, giving you our best advice regarding the the projects uh, that you're uh, running. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, and I'll see you next time. Good. Thank you. Thank Alan. you, everyone.